Okay, so how is everyone today? Good. Okay, so this is college algebra, right? Okay, good. Just make sure I'm in the right place, too. Okay, so this is college algebra. Uh, this is, I'm the instructor, Dr. Brady McCary. This is my contact information. The best way to get a hold of me is email. Uh, my office is this one. Somehow I forgot to put it in that box. So my office is FA 2.402. On campus, there's three buildings with founders in their name, and you're in one of them. So this is Founders. One building north is Founders North, and one building west is Founders Annex. I'm in Founders Annex. Okay, uh, on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I teach College Algebra, this course, and I have office hours in my office uh, right after this class in my office. And then on Tuesday, Thursday, I teach a, a, a programming course, and then I have office in a, in a computer lab. And that computer lab is right down there, if we could look through the, the building. Okay. Uh, any question about that? Okay. Uh, so, this is the textbook we'll be using. Uh, it's pu published by OpenStax. You can download a PDF of this textbook for free at the following link. That one. Uh, you can buy a physical copy of the book if you want uh, at the bookstore or from Amazon or what have you, uh, if you wish. I don't have any preference on whether or not you do that. Okay, but the, the, the thing that you must buy, must purchase, is we'll be using an online homework system called WebAssign and it costs $32. Now, about, about that. So, WebAssign is a web page where you, you log on and then you say, you know, it says your instructor has posted a homework, whatever, whatever, and you do it online. Okay, so you gotta pay for that service and the, when, you, when you buy it, some, there are some places like the bookstore and Amazon and what, what have you, where you can buy WebAssign licenses. But you need to know that they're tied to the publisher. So the publisher of this textbook is OpenStax. OpenStax. There's lots of textbook publishers. For example, one of them is called Cengage. And if you purchase a WebAssign license that is for Cengage, then it's not going to work for us. And so I'm, I'm being very careful to say that because last semester what happened is that the bookstore stocked the OpenStax book and also WebAssign licenses for Cengage. <laughs> and that messed everyone up for like two weeks. Okay, so then, so mind that carefully. Now that being said, the first time, you, you can subvert the whole problem uh, and ambiguity because the first time you log on to WebAssign, it'll say, the course has just begun and there's a 14 day grace period so you can use WebAssign, but you don't have a license. Do you want to buy one now? If you say yes, when you log on to the College Algebra one, you say, yeah, I want to do it, then that'll be the right one. You're not, you're not, you don't have a chance to mess it up. <laughs> okay? It'll be right. If you already have a license, uh, if you bought one and it's for OpenStax, then that'll work. Okay? If you bought, if you, if you have a license for some other means, I have no idea if it's going to work. You're going to have to work, work that out with WebAssign. Okay, so any questions about that? It's, it's $32. Okay. So, uh, good. So the required supplies for this course is you'll need regular access to a computer so we can do email. Uh, also so you can do your online homework. Also there will be written homework which you'll need to download print, so you'll also need access to a printer. Uh, you'll need a scientific, non-graphing, non-programmable calculator. So there's lots of calculators that have the ability to do algebra. None of them are allowed. Okay. So on your homework, I'm not, tr not going to try and watch you or anything on your homework. So you do whatever you want to do on your homework. Okay. But on the quizzes uh, and the exams, it, they will be proctored, someone will be watching, and it will be considered cheating to use a calculator which can perform algebraic tasks for you. Okay. 
if you're not sure whether or not your calculator um, is, a, is one that I consider legitimate, I'll be happy to look at it after class. Okay, I recommend a TI-30 something or other. I'll, I didn't bring it today, I'll bring it next time so you can see what it looks like. Okay, any questions about that? Uh, so, during lecture, I don't care if you have your cell phones out, like on the desk, so you can check time or whatever, but uh, please do not be browsing and doing other not college algebra things in class with your cell phone for a variety of reasons. So, for, pers for your personal reasons, okay, you and maybe someone who loves you and society at large have all paid a lot for your privilege to be here. So, don't waste it. Okay, that's for you. And then for everyone behind you, when you hold up a screen, everyone behind you can see it. And now I want you to imagine. So this is a math course, okay? Math is boring and tedious and whatever. Uh, let's imagine that we're halfway through the course and we're halfway through a lecture about some boring topic. And then someone in front of you pulls up their cell phone and now they're looking at a cat video playing a piano. Okay? Everyone who can see that is gone. You might as well not even be in the class. Don't even, don't even be here. Okay? It's totally a disruption. So if you must use a screen, if you simply must to take notes or whatever, then I request and require that you sit in the back so that other people can't see your screen. Okay? Uh, and on the, on the quizzes and the exams, there's no cell phones whatsoever. Okay, for the simple reason that they can be used to communicate, and that's, that's never going to be acceptable. Okay, I understand that you can put a calculator app on your, on your cell phone. Not going to be acceptable. Okay, good. Any questions about that? Okay, we'll be using Blackboard. At UTD, we call that e-learning to do the gradebook. If, you, you've, if this is not your first, time, first semester here, you've surely used Blackboard already. Uh, in the basement of the library is um, a place called the Testing Center. We'll be doing weekly quizzes there. Uh, what that means is that you'll, every week you'll show up and say, I'm here to take quiz seven for college algebra. And they'll say, okay, let's see your photo ID. And they'll check you in and you do it. Okay? And you, they have lockers where you can put your stuff, but things like purses and cell phones, they're not allowed to go into the testing room. So when you go to the testing center, you know, don't bring your grand piano because it won't fit in the locker. Okay, good. This is the course webpage. That's where I'll post notes and other things for you to download and homeworks and things like that. Uh, email addresses. So this is UTD's, UTD has email and, a, and an email policy. So you have an email address, a UTD email address, and I have a UTD email address. And the fact that you're in this course means that you and I have a professional relationship instructor to student. That means that anything that we communicate is official UTD business. Therefore, when you want to communicate with me over email, you must send me an email from your UTD email address to my UTD email address. I understand if you have a Google email address or a Yahoo or, what, or whatever. So do I. If you send me an email, if somehow you find my personal email address, which is not magic, okay, it's posted all over the internet, okay. If you send one to my personal email address or from your personal email address, I will just delete it if my filters don't delete it automatically. Okay. It, is, it is not within UTD policy for us to communicate over email except over UTD's email. Good. <clears throat> now, in addition to that, our UTD inboxes have a quota, which means that they can only have so many messages and attachments and what have you in there. And we just had a break. And if you got sent, you know, 48 gigabytes of cat videos, then, and they're all in your inbox, your inbox is probably full and can't receive any more messages. Okay? And you stop receiving messages when your inbox is full. So you need to mind that. Because what will happen is I and your other instructors may send you a message that says there's an assignment due in 10 days or whatever. And if in 12 days you come back to me and say, oh, I, I didn't receive that email. Well, sorry. 
or I didn't check my email. Sorry, that's your problem. It's not my problem. Okay, so does everyone get the email policy? Good. So also in the library, but not in the basement, is the math lab. It's like on the second or third floor or something like that. It is a room full of people who, uh, it's their job to listen to your <laughs> math problems. <laughs> you go there, you say, I need help doing whatever, and uh, they'll help you. Okay, it, I won't say it's free because you've paid for it, but it is no charge, no further charge. Okay, your, your, your tuition and fees pay for the service. Okay, so you should go there. I encourage it. Um, <clears throat> any questions about that? The makeup policy is pretty simple. It's more or less that there are no makeups unless you have a university approved excuse. That includes things like, I had an emergency like a medical emergency, or someone, I have a dependent, and they had a medical emergency, or what have you. Or, another example of an excuse is, I'm on the chess team, and we're going to go dominate this other school in chess. UTD's chess team is great. <laughs> That's, I, I, I like that, I don't know why. Okay, or the soccer team, or whatever, okay? When you have university approved travel, great. Okay, your coach or sponsor or whatever knows all about how to contact me and make a f form letter that says we're doing whatever. Okay, we'll make arrangements. Okay, but you ha in such a case, when you know in advance, you have to inform me a week in advance so that I can make plans. If you're on the chess team, I think that's terrific. But if you tell me the day before that you're not going to be able to turn in a, an assignment, I'm sorry, you're going to get a zero on that. If you, told, if you told me seven days before, we'll make it work. Okay, good. Any questions about that? Okay, so then this link is a link containing UTD's official policies for all courses. And you should read it. It contains a lot of important information in it. Uh, just the highlights, though, is things like UTD has an academic dishonesty policy. And academic dishonesty is a euphemism for cheating. So the long and the short of it is, is that I'll be watching. And if I catch you, I'm going to turn you in. I must, and I will. And it will be a big problem for both of us, actually, but mostly for you. Uh, so from a purely selfish standpoint, I request that you don't cheat, because it increases my workload. Okay? Also for you, it is bad for you. So please don't. Um, another uh, policy that is relevant, quite relevant, is that on campus there is uh, the Office of Student Accessibility. Uh, some people have hearing or seeing deficits, for example, and they need to be specially accommodated in lectures or quizzes, what have you. Okay, so then if you don't have an OSA file, then I'm not talking to you. But if you do have an OSA file, then you need to know, and you were advised by the OSA, and I'll advise you also, that I do not get informed by the OSA of your, of your file. I don't get informed of it. If you want me to know about it, you have to disclose it to me because it's your own private business and they don't disclose it to me. Only you can. Okay, so for example, some, some students uh, have an OSA file that says, this student is allowed to take the test in a quiet environment. Okay, no problem. So we'll do that. But if we get halfway through the semester and you know, you've, taken, you've taken six quizzes, and you say, oh, actually, I have an OSA account, an OSA file. OK, the, the subsequent quizzes will, will make it happen. But you're not going to redo any of the other ones. OK? So any questions about the OSA thing? OK, good. So at this point, I've, I don't know if, if it's true, but it, I think it's true that I've, I've done almost every conceivable accommodation. I've worn mics. I've, I've been videotaped, I've done, done a lot of it. So don't be shy. Uh, I'll do it. Uh, any questions about these? Okay. Uh, good. So this box, this box, the main point of this box is that this course, more than any other course probably that you've ever taken, math course, is that this course is about showing your work. If you don't show your work, you should not have an expectation of getting any credit. It may be the case that you've taken a math course before where somehow they ask you some question and at the end 
there's 42 apples, or what have you. And if no matter what you write in there, no matter what incomprehensible thing you write in there, as long as you write 42, you get it. Okay, that's not how this course is. Okay, you will show your steps, you will write neatly, and it will be in order, or you will not receive credit. That's the way it's going to be. So the sword cuts both ways, okay, which is to say that if I give you an exercise, and at the end there's supposed to be 42 apples, and you show step one, step two, step three, step four, all the way down, all the steps are good, and at the last step you say, therefore 38 plus 38 apples and four more apples is 54 apples, which is obviously not right. But, but all the steps up to there were right. Okay, then you're going to get a lot of partial credit. Eight, eight out of ten, nine out of ten, something like that. Okay, but if you just give me some nonsense and you write down 42 apples, zero every time. Any questions about that? I will show you in painstaking detail what it means to show your work. Okay. Uh, we have <clears throat> a link to the academic calendar. This includes things like uh, the last day to withdraw, what days the university is closed, the last day of class, things like that. You should familiarize yourself with it. Um, so this is the schedule that will go by. Uh, these textbook sections correspond to this textbook, our textbook. Um, we will go over approximately one textbook section per day. And this schedule is subject to change a little bit, right? Sometimes I might think, well, we need to spend a little more time on that section, or sometimes the section might go pretty quick. So I'll update it as, as we go. Uh, I put comments in here so that you would be able to remember what days we're not going to meet. So for example, next week, we're not going to meet on Monday because the university is closed, Martin Luther King Day. And then in the 10th week, that's spring break, so we won't meet meet then either. Uh, any questions about the schedule? Yes? Um, are you going to talk about the tests? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> oh, that's on our, never mind. You sign up for that separately, right? Or not right. separately, but it's on our schedule. Right. On Gallus, never mind. <laughs> so a as for exams, there'll be exactly two uh, exams, one in the middle and one at the end. Okay, so the registrar has not set the one in the middle yet. Sometimes they do that. I wish they would set it. I wish it would already be set, but they haven't. But the exam, the midterm exam, is going to be on some Thursday night that's on the order of seven weeks from now. And I'll let you, I'll pro, the registrar will probably tell me next week. And I'll tell you at that time. Well, I mean, the registrar will tell all of us, <laughs> really. But I'll, I'll point it out next week. Okay. Uh, there's four kinds of assignments in this class. One of them is online homework. Uh, that's where you'll log on to WebAssign and it'll say here's a homework assignment and you do it. So the purpose of WebAssign to make sort of a sports analogy, the way we're going to use WebAssign, is it's like drill. So if you want to learn how to play soccer, for example, then one thing a coach might do is say, okay, here's 10 cones in a row and I want you to dribble in and out of the cones using only your left foot for the next 20 minutes. Okay, <laughs> in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out. Just keep doing it over and over. And then, okay, now that you've done that, now do it with your right foot. In and out, in and out, in and out, in and out. Really boring and tedious. But it's, part, it's one of the fundamentals of being able to play soccer. Okay, you've got to be able to do it. Okay, that's what web assign is like. So, when you're doing the web assign homework, if it feels not very difficult, but tedious, then we're doing it right. Okay? So everybody get the web assign thing. Okay. Good. Then there's also written homework. Written homework, <coughs> ah, a as for the online homeworks, to back up just a second, there will be one per lecture. So for example, after this lecture, I'm going to go back to my office, and I'm going to make an online homework. And I'm going to post it, and it's going to be due in seven days at 11.59 p.m. Except it's not going to be due in seven days because we don't have class on Monday, so I'm going to move it to Wednesday. Okay? Under normal circumstances, 
you would have on online homework due seven days at 11.59 p.m. But we're going to make it nine this time. Okay, so there's on the order of 40-ish lectures. So that means that you'll have on the order of 40-ish online homeworks, one per lecture. You will also have written homework. So written homework is individual sheets of paper, one sheet of paper for one exercise. After each lecture, including today, I'm going to go back to my office. I'm going to make two exercises, and I'm going to post them on the course web page. And you'll need to go to the course web page, download them, print them, and do them. Okay, and then you'll turn them in on the corresponding lecture. So if Monday, if next Monday wasn't wasn't weird, then today is Monday. You would turn in two written homework exercises on Monday. Except it's going to be Wednesday <laughs> because of Martin Luther King Day. Okay, but normally a Wednesday lecture, you'll turn in homeworks the subsequent Wednesday. A Friday lecture, you turn in homeworks the subsequent Friday. Okay, so now in addition to that, there will be quizzes. Okay, so then the quizzes is you'll have a week of time, really actually six days, not a week. You'll have six days window in which to do it. That is to say, I'll post a quiz, I'll make a quiz, I'll deliver it to the testing center, and then I'll tell you it is available for you to take at the, at the testing center. During, sometime during this window of time, from Monday at 8 a.m. to Saturday at the close of business of the testing center, you've got to go to the testing center and say, I'm here to take the quiz number eight for college algebra. And they'll say, okay, who are you? And they'll check your photo ID and whatever. Okay? Good. So that's three kinds of assignments. Okay, the fourth kind is an exam, and we'll talk about the exam in a minute. Okay, but is there any question about these? So the big question, or at least a big question, is, is what is the timing of all this? When is it all due? Okay, so let's go over that. Because it's, it's, it's just slightly complicated until you see it drawn out. So, uh, I'm writing something on this sheet of paper, and all of the course notes that I write will be on such sheets of paper. And then after the lecture, I'll take these sheets of paper, I'll scan them, and post them as a PDF on the course webpage. Okay, so don't be too worried if you miss something, because it's going to be up there. Also, this thing in front of me is a camera, and I'm going to post that on the internet. Okay, so, you'll have... You'll have it all. Now, don't take that as license not to be engaged in the, in the lecture, because you should know how you're made okay, as a human being. The more engaged you are in this process, the more likely it is that you will understand and retain this material. So it is not a good strategy for you to just sit there and watch this as if it's a movie. Rather, it's a much better strategy for you to be doing something active, like asking a question or writing something down or, or whatever. Okay, good. But it's all going to be available to you. So I'm making a remark. So we'll have lectures. And we'll have online homework. And we'll have written homework. and we'll have quizzes. Okay, <clears throat> so today is Monday, so Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So on this Monday, today, 
in just a minute, we're going to start going over section 1.1. Okay, then I'm going to go back to my office. I'm going to make an online homework. And under normal circumstances, there would be an online homework due here. But we don't have class on that day, so this one's gone due to Martin Luther King Day. So it'll be due here. Then on Wednesday, we're going to go over section 1.2. I'm going to go back to my office, and there is a class on Wednesday, so there's going to be another one due on Wednesday. Then on Friday, we're going to go over section 1.3. I'm going to go back to my office and make an online homework, and it's going to be due on Friday. Now, in addition to that, for each one of these, I'm going to make two written homework exercises. So. Under normal circumstances, these ones over 1.1 would, would be due on Monday, but they're due on Wednesday. So there'll be one, for one from 1.1 and another one from 1.1. And there'll be one from 1.2 and another one from 1.2. So these you'll have to bring to lecture. Okay. Then one of these. <coughs> So that means that there's no online homework due this week, and there's no online homework, uh, no written homework due this week, and there's no quiz this week. There's none of that this week. Then after this week, after this one, there will be a quiz in here. So this is section, you'll have a quiz over section 1.1, 1 1.2, 1 and 1.3. So then we lecture for a week, we homework for a week. We quiz for a week. Okay, now, next week, we're going to be going over section 1.4 and 1.5 ish on Wednesday and 1.6 on Friday. So that means that there's going to be no on online homework or written homework due on those days. On, on that Monday because there was no corresponding previous Monday. But you're going to have <clears throat> an online homework for 1.4 and 1.5 due here and one for 1.6 due there. And you're going to have written homework, two of them there for 1.4, two of them here for 1.5, two of them here for 1.6. In, the, in that week. And in that week, we'll be going over 2.1 and some stuff about intervals and some more stuff about intervals. So what I'm telling you is that by the time we get to the third week, there's going to be three things all happening at the same time. You're going to be learning new material. You're going to be homeworking over the previous week's material and you're going to be quizzing over two weeks ago material. So the way it works is like this. You do the online homework first, ish. Then you do the written homeworks. At the end of the week of those written homeworks, I'll post the keys to those written homeworks. Then all the, the following week, you'll take quiz over that. And the quizzes are quite similar to the written homeworks. Okay? So the so the written homeworks and the online homeworks are worth 15% of your course grade each. So online homework is 15% of your grade. Written homework is 15% of your grade. Quiz average is the rest, 70%. So it's most of your grade. So that means that the optimal strategy is to do all of the online homework, do all of the written homework, look at the keys for the written homework to see whether or not you think you got those questions right, study what you didn't get right, and then take the quiz. Okay, that's how it works. Then, at the halfway through the semester, you will have taken half the quizzes and we'll have a midterm exam. And some of the quizzes, you will look at those exercises and say, you know, I really wish I would have done better on quiz four, question three, or whatever. 
Well, there will be a, a, an exercise on the exam where you can improve your grade on quiz four, question three. So by the time you get to the midterm, you'll have a, you'll have a self-directed study plan. Oh, I need to, I didn't know how to do quiz four, question three, quiz two, question two, and quiz five, question one. I didn't know how to do them first go round, but I can, I can fix it on the midterm. Okay. So for that reason, which is to say, uh, say you got three out of 10 on quiz five, question one on the quiz, then on the midterm, you do better. You can have that one. You can have the better one on the midterm. Okay. The purpose is, is that I don't really care when in the duration of the semester you learn a topic. I don't really care. I don't really care when. The only thing I care is how you exit. So if you didn't have it right on the quiz, then well maybe you have it right by the exam and that'd be fine by me. Okay, yes? And it like replaces that question? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. And so for that reason there are no quiz makeups. Okay? So then if if you you couldn't make if you couldn't make the quiz for some reason, okay, in the first place, it's it's a pretty hard sell to say that at no time during during the the hours of, of eight thirty AM to nine PM on, on Monday through Saturday could I take that quiz. That's a pretty hard sell. Okay, and in the second place, even if that is the case, somehow, then you can just make it up on the exam. Okay. Any questions? Yes? For the web assign, it's not timed or anything, right? You no. just log in, log out, and go back in. Right. Okay. You have you have you have five attempts for each for each exercise. Okay. Good. Questions before we get to math. So this is this is the rhythm that we'll be in. Lecturing, new stuff, homeworking, the previous week's stuff, quizzing, two weeks ago stuff. Okay. <coughs> yes? Uh, what, what did you say would be on a Thursday, the exams? The, the midterm is on a Thursday. It will be on a Thursday. If it's not possible to make it on a Thursday, will there be any alternate accommodations or arrangements that can be made? only with the University Approved Excuse. So it'll be, you'll, you'll be advised of the exam time on the order of six weeks in advance. Okay. So it should be plenty of time for you to make arrangements. Other questions? Okay, so we're in section 1.1. And it is called the real numbers. And I'd, I'd like for you to know that every time I read that phrase or say that phrase, I have a little laugh inside because it's actually a joke. Right? Isn't it kind of interesting, I think, that they're called the real numbers when you put an adjective like that in front of something? Real numbers? Well, what does that mean? Are there purple numbers? I don't get it. Real numbers? Okay, so then hopefully in a few lectures, I'll be able to tell you why it's actually a joke that's several centuries old at this point. Okay. So, a remark about uh, sets of numbers. So, the first set that we're going to deal with by name is called the naturals. The naturals are denoted by N. And when you're writing a textbook, they, they're frequently denoted with a bold N. But I don't have a bold pencil. So the, the stylistic convention to write a bold letter in is like this. So this, is, this stylistic convention is called blackboard bold. It is denoted in this way. Or it is defined in this way. Uh, it's the set that contains one, two, three, four, etc. Okay. Good. 
So can someone tell me a number which is natural, but not one of the ones that I listed? Five. <laughs> good. good. <laughs> Terrific. Okay, so can someone tell me a number which is, which is a number, but not natural? 5.5. .5. Not natural. Zero. Not natural. I'm not making a, a, a value judgment against these numbers. They're just not in that set. OK. So zero, not natural. OK. Well, let's come up with a set that contains all the naturals, but also has zero. So the set I'm thinking of is called the integers. So this set is the set that contains 0, positive and negative 1, positive and negative 2, positive and negative 3, etc. Okay. But then, okay, how are we going to how are we going to denote the integers? That would be a good guess, right? If the naturals are n, then the integers would be i, except no. They're denoted with z, because obviously it's z, right? The reason why it's z is because when this convention was being set down, it was being set down in German-speaking Europe a few centuries ago. And what is the German word, one of the German words for number? I'll give you a hint. It starts with Z. Zahlen. Z-A-H-L-E-N. Okay, that's why it's Z. Terrific. Can someone give me an, a, a number, which is an integer, but not one of the ones that I listed? Negative 100. Negative 100. Very good. Terrific. Can someone give me a number that's not an integer? about that one, right? Someone already gave me one. 5.5. .5. Not an integer. Notice that every natural is an integer. So 5 is natural, 5 is an integer. Okay. So now I want, an, I want a set of numbers that, that contains all the integers, but it also contains 5.5. I'm worried about that 5.5. .5. Got to take care of it. Okay, so this set that I'm thinking of is going, to, is going to be called the rationals. It is the set of all expressions of the form P divided by Q such that P and Q are in the set of integers and Q is not zero. So the state of Texas assures me that you're familiar with this notation. <laughs> state of Texas has known to be a mistake. So the way this is read out loud is this is saying this this notation is called set builder notation in the first place. That's its, its name. And <clears throat> this means the set of all expressions of the form P divided by Q. This vertical bar means such that such that the numerator and the denominator are integers, and the denominator isn't zero. Okay. So that's the set of rationals. How are we going to denote the rationals? R would be a good one, but it's not R. It's Q <laughs> for quotient, actually. OK. So can someone give me an example of a quotient? Two fifths. That is a rational number, because the numerator is an integer, 
<laughs> the denominator is an integer, and 5 is not 0. Okay, the expression, how about the expression 3 divided by 0? Is that a quotient? Nope. We said that 0 denominators were not allowed. Uh, how about um, 7? Is that a quotient? Right. I could, I could say that it's 7 over 1. Just as well, I could say it's 14 over 2. Uh, so yes. How about 5.5? .5? Is 5.5 .5 rational? Okay. How? Eleven over two, or fifty-five over ten. Okay, so five point five is in there. So can someone give me a number that's not rational? Pi isn't rational, which is to say that pi cannot be expressed as the ratio of two integers. It's not possible. Another one is the square root of 2. That is not expressible as the ratio of two integers. So now, um, <clears throat> it's not possible in this class to provide the proof that pi is not rational. It, it, it is provable but it just requires techniques that are beyond the scope of the class. But I'd like to point something out to you that's pretty surprising, I hope, and that is that there's numbers that aren't rational. That's surprising, I think, because essentially every number that human beings deal with is rational. Essentially every one of them almost, in, nor in the normal course of events. There was a pizza. It was cut into eight pieces. I ate three of them. Therefore, I ate three-eighths of a pizza. And three-eighths is a rational number. There's 27 people in this room. 27 is a rational number. If someone leaves, there's 26. And that's a rational number. If there's a catastrophic accident and half of a person leaves, that's 26 and a half people. That's still a rational number and a tragedy, right? <laughs> okay, but it's still a rational number. Okay? So, you know, how much money do you have in your bank account? Well, you could count it in pennies. That's a rational number. How much did that thing cost? You could count it in pennies. That's a rational number. So essentially, almost every number that you deal with in experience is a rational number. Now, I'm telling you, that there's numbers that aren't. Okay. So now we want all, I'll put this in quotes, all of the numbers on the number line. And there's no more precise way for me to describe this set to you than this. In a, in a math class for math majors, you describe exactly what this means. But in this class, we don't have a real good way to do it. And the set of this set is called the reals. And it is denoted with R, finally. Okay. So we're going to work primarily in the reals. Okay. <clears throat> so, let's justify let's justify that that we need to work in the reals, that the reals that the reals in the first place actually exist. Because it's a, it's a critical matter to show that something exists before you start talking about it. The reason why it's critical is because Anything that you say about an empty set is about the elements of an empty set is automatically true. 
So, for example, are you aware that UTD has won every national football championship that we've ever participated in? Undefeated. That's incredible. Is it true? Yes. Why is it true? We don't even have a football team. The set of all national championship games that we've ever participated in is empty. So it's a true statement. So if we're going to be using the reels, if we're going to be using the reels, then we need to be sure that there actually are numbers that aren't rational. Otherwise, we might be talking nonsense. Okay, so now we need to show that there's a reel that's not rational. So I'm going to, I'm going to provide the proof to you that there is a number that we all agree exists that's not rational. Now, I'm going to prove it to you, and it's going to be a little bit technical. It may be the most technical math argument you've seen to date. But you should be at ease, because this is, I'm not going to ask you to reproduce this proof. The purpose of the, there's, there's two purposes for me to go through this. One purpose is for, you, for me to justify the claim that we have to use the real numbers. The second purpose is I want you to see what it is like to make a math argument because you're going to have to be making smaller versions of arguments like this. And there may be an off chance that someone in here has never seen a math argument and they don't know whether or not they like it. So if you like what you see, if you, if you like the machinery of it, then you might consider taking more math classes. If you don't, run away. <laughs> don't be a math major. OK. <clears throat> so claim. <coughs> The square root of 2 is not in the quotients. That's a claim. It is not expressible as the ratio of two integers. Now I'm going to prove it. I'm going to prove it by assuming otherwise. In particular, I'm going to assume that 1 the square root of 2 is in the rationals, and as a consequence of that, that the square root of 2 is equal to p divided by q. And because the square root of 2 is known to be positive, it's about 1.4, that means that p can be taken to be positive and q can be taken to be positive. So they're both positive. And p over q is simplified. So what does that mean? Simplified. Can someone give me an example of a quotient that is not simplified? Oh, a quotient. A quotient. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, 10 over 5. 10 over 5. That is a quotient. It is. But it's not simplified because it could be a, you could factor out a 5 and write it as 2 over 1. Okay? So, okay. Assume that this is the case. Then, square root of 2 is p over q. Now I'm going to take this and I'll multiply both sides by q. What happens to the right hand side when we do that? It's just p because the q's cancel. So we get q square root 2 is p. Now I'm going to square both sides. q square root 2, we'll square that, is equal to p squared. So now squaring, squaring means repeated multiplication. That's what it means. So it means q square root 2 multiplied by q square root 2. That's its meaning is p squared. So if this, if I had wrote exponent 5, I would have had to copy this 5 times. Blah, 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 blah. OK, now I'm going to reorder this product and say that this is, this is the square root of 2 squared q squared is equal to p squared. So the right-hand side didn't change. And then I did that. Well, what is the square root of 2 squared? It's 2. <coughs> 
So here we have one of the consequences of our assumption. So we're saying that 2q squared is p squared. And now I'd like to point out to you my, what I said at the beginning, that you're not going to be required to reproduce this argument if you're starting to feel uncomfortable. Okay. So now, p squared is 2 times something. And as a result of that, that means that p squared is even. p squared is 2 times something, so it's even. This symbol right here means therefore. Now I want you to imagine for a moment. Can someone give me a positive even integer? Four. Four. Okay. Now square it. Okay. Is 16 even? Yes. Yes. How about another positive even integer? How about 10? 10 squared is 100. Is that even? It is. Okay. How about a positive odd number? How about 9? What's 9 squared? 81. 81. 9 is odd. Is 81 odd? How about 11? What's 11 squared? 121. That's odd. So notice that squaring preserves evenness and it preserves oddness. If, if you have a number and you square it, a, a positive integer, and you square it, and it was even, that means it was even to begin with. If it was odd, that means it was odd to begin with. Therefore, a consequence of this is that P itself must be even. We're halfway through the argument, and we'll finish it on Wednesday. So have a nice Monday.